All right, so we'll get right into it. The bridal paradigm and the end times church. So those two things are very much related, and I'm going to explain a little bit ab- about what the bridal paradigm means. Uh, most people kind of already know what end times church kind of might refer to, um, but when we're talking about the bridal paradigm. Uh, one of the clearest points of scripture, uh, most pivotal points of scripture that talk about the identity of the church as a bride would be in Revelation 22. And this is one of the last verses in all of scripture. One of the last verses in all of scripture. This is ending the book of Revelation um, and how it ends. It's almost like this dialogue between the church and Jesus Christ who's coming back. So it, in Revelation 22, verses 17 and 20, it says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And he who testifies these things, this is Jesus, uh, he says in response to the bride and the Spirit saying, Come, he has something to say to that, and he says, Yes, I am coming soon. And then in response to that, uh, we once again say, Amen, come Lord Jesus. So it's almost like a back and forth, a dialogue. It's not just like, you just sit back there and like shut up and listen, and I'm going to tell you everything that's happening. It's more of a dialogue that's happening between the church and God who's coming back. It's almost like God is saying, like, I care about your response. I care about what you are saying to me. Like, what, you, what input you have to give to me actually is going to shape how I respond to you. So the spirit and the bride say, come. Now, because this is a very uh, central scripture for end times, and because the word that is used to denote the church, it isn't army, it isn't family, it isn't building, it isn't a temple of the Holy Spirit. It could be any of these things, but the word that most uh, well depicts the church in the end times as she's crying out for Jesus Christ to come back is bride. And this is a revelation that all of us, however uh, comfortable we feel with this or not, we have to kind of eventually come to grips with this. And I've talked to even like uh, some guys, for example, that have some guys who have a hard time grasping this thought of like, I am the bride to a guy. (laughs) Like, I don't know how exactly that's supposed to work. And there's like mental barriers that are there. Um, And so I'm going to explain throughout the course of tonight, like, what we mean by bride. But regardless of how uh, easily this concept comes to you or not, it is still something that all of us in the body of Christ have to come to terms with, especially as we near the end times as well. One more scripture that I'd like to uh, highlight as well that kind of talks about this dynamic between the Lord and his church and being married, it is in Isaiah 62. There's so many passages in scripture that refer to this, but this is also one of the clearest as well. In Isaiah 62, verses 4 through 5, he's speaking over his people, and he says, Oh, no longer will they call you deserted, or your name uh, or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah, and that means my delight is in her, and your land Beulah, which means married. For the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. So this is, again, once again, it's a dynamic where um, God, it's in the midst of talking about all the different things that are going to be happening. There's going to be a revival. There's going to be restoration of the land. There's going to be double portion, you know, wealth pouring in, all these things that are happening. And yet, at the center of all this, God's vision is to see his people and himself married. When he sees his people, it's almost like saying, like, no no longer will you be single. But when people look at you, they will know that you are married. It's like that. It's a change in identity. And uh, even to the point where uh, her, her her name is changed. So my delight is in her, and her, um, her land is called married. So it's at a very deep core um, identity level that this is happening. It's not just like, you'll feel kind of like a married person. No, it's like, no, your name is going to be married. You're going to have a name change. Just in the same way that when you marry somebody, you change your last name to that person. Uh, In the same way, you're going to have a new name once uh, we are together, once uh, we are married. So if this... this, um, 
kind of brings a little bit more of understanding of how God sees his church, um, this sets a good foundation for all of us, when, even when we're thinking about the end times. Sometimes we, we, we've talked about this already, but often when we look at scripture that is facing the end, uh, regarding the end times, we get caught up in a lot of different things. And granted, they are very, like, abnormal, like, unconventional images. Like, there's a beast with all these different heads, and then there's these wheels that are turning, and then there's a sea, like, crystal, and there's all this imagery that's so foreign to us. But sometimes when we get so caught up in that, we forget that the central theme of all these things is there's a wedding that is coming, and that's the center, uh, the epicenter of everything that's happening. Everything else is almost like peripheral to that center theme. So going a little bit deeper, what is, so, so what exactly is the bridal paradigm? I've, I've kind of talked about two different scriptures, but what are we talking about when we talk about the bridal paradigm? Um, starting with paradigm, hopefully that this is this a little bit uh, more self-explanatory. When we look at the definition of paradigm, it's just a framework a framework containing the basic assumptions, ways of thinking, and methodology that are commonly accepted by members of a scientific community. Such cognitive frameworks shared by members of any discipline or group. So for example, a company's business paradigm. So it's a framework with which we work. So when we're talking about the bridal paradigm, what does that mean? As I said before, the church has many identities, as mentioned in the Bible, an army, a body, a building of living stones, a city, a priesthood, a flock belonging to the good shepherd, a temple of the Holy Spirit, etc. There's so many different ways in which the church is described. But by far the most prevalent identity emphasized in end times related passages is that of a bride awaiting her bridegroom. And so what does that mean? The bridal paradigm is a framework where the discovery, the characteristics, the response, and the heart posture of the church is based on the identity of herself as a bride. This positions her in a unique way to respond to the events unfolding connected to the end times. So when you think about everything that happens through 22 chapters of the book of Revelation, um, if you don't fully understand our role as a bride, it's very easy to get shaken up uh, by everything that you read in the 22 chapters. It's not easy stuff to swallow, really. When you think about it, it's, it's going to be like two-thirds of the earth actually dying. It's like massive genocide, and it goes into detail regarding things like that. It talks about pestilence. It talks about natural disasters. So we see glimpses of this here and there, and when we do see glimpses of this here and there, it shakes us to the core. Like, all of a sudden, everything that we thought uh, we were secure in and is, like, taken for granted, all of a sudden, we can't, we can't seem to place our feet on firm ground anymore. Now, can you imagine if all the things that are talked about in the book of Revelation, if th- all those things were to come to pass, like, our view of God's goodness, our view of God's commitment to his people, our understanding of the victory of the church and the end times, if we don't have an understanding of ourselves as a bride, all these things will get shaken. Our understanding of who God is, it's so easy to fall into offense, for example. When you face personal tragedy in your life, the first thing, your, our human response is like, why God? I thought, you know, I thought we were... I thought we were close. I thought we were tight. I thought we had an arrangement. You know, I thought I was doing really well. Like, why did this have to happen? Why me? I thought you were good. And all of a sudden, our understanding of our relationship with God, his intentions for us, his character that is supposed to never change, but it feels like it's changed in my personal circumstances, all these things are shaken just by one tragedy. Now, imagine if at a worldwide scale, tragedy was to strike the globe. Now, for a church that is not grounded in our identity as a bride and is not secure in her relationship with the Lord, can you imagine what kind of offense, what kind of falling away, what kind of um, chaos, confusion, false prophecies, all these things that are already talked about? It's so obvious that all these things are going to come to pass, especially if the uh, the church is not grounded in that identity as a bride. Does that make sense? So this is going to provide almost like a pipeline Like, it's going to provide framework for us to fully understand things regarding the end times and do it in in, in a particular, from a particular vantage point. Um, 
So only when the church understands her relationship to Christ as a bride will she be able to partner with the longings of his heart in the end times. So we're not just called to like just tolerate the end times and try to do without offense in your heart and just try to make it through, cruise through. That's not his intent actually for the church. His intent for the church is actually to partner with what he's doing on the earth. And if we don't fully understand what's on his heart, we don't understand his intentions, it's going to be very hard for us to come alongside what he's doing on the earth um, and partner with that. So that is what the bridal paradigm refers to. It's a framework from which we understand our relationship with the Lord, our identity as a church, and even the events unfolding in the end times. Now, next question is, what is unique about the identity of a bride? Why bride? It could be anything. It could be like sister. It could be aunt. Like <laughs> the, 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 the spirit and the aunt say come. Like it can be anything, right? Like why? <laughs> why bride? And so I'm just going to go through very quickly six different characteristics that are very pivotal in our understanding of what a bride is marked by. Here's the first one. The first one, very obviously, is love. Very obviously is love. This is a characteristic that cannot be fully embodied by the term army, for example. Yes, an army is like vicious and is like loyal and all these things, but to think of an army as like lovesick, like I don't know, it doesn't quite capture it. Now, love is something that would be fully captured by the term of bride. Can you imagine like a loveless bride, like right on their wedding day? They're like, I don't know, like this guy proposed to me like five months ago and I mean, I said, yeah, and here we are, you know, like completely cold, loveless. It's like a transaction. Let's sign this paper. Let's get it over with. But it's like when you see a bride on her wedding day, you want her to see in love, like be in love with whoever she's going to be marrying. So love is going to be a very pivotal, very crucial uh, characteristic in our identity as a bride. This is why last month we had to set um, a foundation of intimacy with God before we even attempt to tackle end times. This is what somebody had, had told me um, this past month. I had a really amazing conversation with a person that is that has been praying into this for a while. And they told me, like, in their journey with the Lord, uh, they were very supernaturally led through um, to, like, study books at a time and go into very deep spiritual truths. And they said, like, the Lord didn't, let me go from Song of Songs for two years. And then after I was done with Song of Songs, that's when he released me to go into the book of Revelation. He said, like, the Lord wouldn't have me, like, even crack open the book of Revelation until I fully understood the intimacy that is central for us to completely understand. It's almost like the Song of Songs is the key to fully understand the book of Revelation. Does that make sense? So what we talked about last month is going to be very crucial in painting a picture of what the end times is going to be about and all the things that we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, First uh, John says this, In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So the church that you see in the book of Revelation is not a church that is like scrambling around anxious, like has he changed his mind? About, has he forgotten about this, uh, about us? Like what's going to happen to us? It's a church that is actually very confident in the love that the bridegroom has for her and in her love for the bridegroom as well. And this is because there's no fear. And this is why we have to talk about love and being a bride before we talk about end times. Um, otherwise, our fears will completely overshadow our understanding of what is happening in the, in the end times. So when, when we have the lens of love, uh, there is no room for fear. Even in the midst of global catastrophe, there is no room for fear. Even when persecution arises, there is no fear. Now the second one is oneness. Oneness with the bridegroom. Now in Ephesians 5... Uh, Apostle Paul is talking about, you know, the dynamics, you know, within a family. And then he goes off into a very random tangent. And this is what he says. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. You think that he's just talking about marriage, like husband and wife. And then he says this. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. 
So it's almost like he's talking about something, and then, no, he's actually talking about something that is even deeper, undergirding this idea, our understanding of mutual submission, understanding of blessing one another, laying down your life for one another. Uh, And in this context, he's actually referring to Christ and the church. What he's saying through this is that our understanding of worldly marriage, like marriage in this age, is only a glimpse, only a shadow of the fullness of oneness between Christ and his church. And this is the kind of oneness that we're going to experience in the end times. So we can't be like, we're, yeah, we're your bride. We've really been waiting for you. You finally come. All right, peace out. Now you do your thing, and I'm going to do my thing. No, there's going to be a oneness that culminates with the coming of Christ. So it's like, it's almost like saying, like a bride marrying her bridegroom, and then they're like, all right, the wedding's over. You go to your house, I'm going to my house. Peace. Like, that's not how it works. You live life together from there on out. There's a oneness. Now, third, of a bride, there is purity. And what I mean by purity is purity as in uh, no compromise, if that makes any sense. So back, uh, referring back to Hosea 2, This is one of the passages that refers to that, and this is what he says. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. I will remove the names of the Baals from her lips. So every other idol, the name of every other idol will be stripped from her lips. And then he says, I will betroth you to me forever. So I'm just picking three different verses from that same passage. So there's a purity about her love and her devotion to the Lord. Now, On this side of eternity, for us, we experience measures of this. There's times when we're like hardcore after the Lord. You're like, I don't care if I get married. I don't care if I'm poor. I don't care if my family disowns me. Like, all I need is you, Jesus. There's times when we really, and and this is like, even though we sometimes say when we're naive or or not, um, there is a measure of purity in our heart that we experience in this life. And uh, often how it happens with most of us is it ebbs and flows. There's times of like die hard, like I'm going to be martyred. Like when, when that day comes, like I'm just going to be one of those people that I will, just like Peter, like I will never deny you. All these people, they're going to fall away, but I will never deny you. Like that's us on certain days. And there's other days when you're like, I, I don't know this guy. You know, I just, you know, <laughs> like really, really quickly in this, uh, you know, it, in a snap, like that's that's all it takes at times. So we only experience uh, in a certain certain measure this kind of wholeness, uh, wholeheartedness in our love and our purity before the Lord. Now, wh- as the end times nears, through different things, the Lord is going to purify his bride even more. Every trace of compromise is just not going to be possible anymore. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, towards the end as well. So those are three. Now, number four is trust. Trust. A bride better trust her bridegroom. Can you imagine marrying somebody? You're like, yeah, sure, we'll do life together, but I don't really know if I can trust you. Like, I, I, don't, I don't really know. No, like, there must be a certain measure of trust. And the more we understand that Jesus, the bridegroom, is perfect in all his ways. He's righteous in all his judgments. Even things that don't make sense to us, his ways are higher. Um, When we finally understand this and come to a growing realization of just how perfect he is, um, our trust will continue, only continue to grow as the end times comes near. So even when we go through trials and tribulations, Psalms 30 says, sing to the Lord, you saints of his, praise his holy name, For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. So even in the midst of darkness, of night, of tragedy, there is a trust deep within the heart of the bride where she knows that this is not where it's going to stay, that this is temporary, that everything that they see happening all around them that this is not uh, going to be the end of it, but there is going to be a consummation. There's going to be n- uh, mourning at the end of this night. There's going to be rejoicing, beauty for ashes, all these different imagery that God, God gives us. Um, there's a trust in us that this is going to come to pass, even when we see the world getting darker around us. Now, this is number, what are we at? Five. Five. This is anticipation. Anticipation. 
I know that it, how we experience weddings here, it, it <laughs> sometimes we don't really see anticipation all that much because of the stress of wedding planning. But can you imagine like a bride like dreading getting married? Like dreading it. Like, fine, I'll go through this thing, but uh, I'm just going to grit my teeth and for the next 40 years, I'm just going to, like, tolerate you, like, living together and stuff. No, like, there's a sense of anticipation, like, can you come quickly? And that's what Revelation 22 was about. Like, don't just come, but come quickly. We yearn for you. We long for you. There's an anticipation for us coming. This is from Revelation 19, just a few chapters before. This is what the saints say unto Jesus, and it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. So it's not just like, all right, we'll chill until you come. But it's like we've done everything in our power to prepare ourselves, to be positioned for your coming. And we've been waiting for this day. You hear like in the tone of of even this like exclamation, this almost like this burst of worship. And it's like it's finally come. It's finally come. The wedding of the lamb has finally come. This is what we've been waiting for. So there's a sense of anticipation, even in the midst of all the things that are happening all around her. And this is finally kind of in line with oneness as well. And this is, we have a shared future. I don't know, sometimes when we think about end times, we think about all the tribulations and then we stop thinking. But there's actually eternity on the other side of that where we actually have a shared future. We actually get to rule and reign with him for a millennium. And depending on your eschatology and how, how you view the end times, but basically for the rest of all of eternity, billions of years from now, we'll still be ruling and reigning with him. We're going to have a shared future. Uh, once again, it's not like you go to your house, I go to my house, and we'll just you know, do our thing for eternity. But the end times, it's almost like the prelude for an eternity shared together with Christ. And that, by far, should outshadow our fear of the things that have to happen right before. Does that make sense? If we are only thinking about, like, oh, no, oh, no, like, I can't, I don't know, I don't know how to feel about this. And then you're not thinking about, we're talking about, if you think, if you are, like, I'm going to get a little bit technical, but if you're pre-millennial in in your eschatology and your view of end times, and so you think that um, uh, Jesus is going to come back before the millennium, um, so most likely your understanding uh, of the end times is like it's going to be a seven-year period like of tribulation, either 3.5 year or a seven-year. But either way, it's a momentary time of shakings, of massive shakings, of all these things happening. And sometimes we get so caught up in those seven years, and that completely absorbs all of our attention that we forget that on the other side of the seven years is eternity. Eternity of there being no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more sickness. And we don't even understand what that would look like. I don't think we've ever experienced anything close to that. Um, And so our understanding needs to be, there's on the other side of all these things that sometimes we get so fixated on, we need to remember that there's eternity in perfect love and unity with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning over the earth. So we have to put a lot of weight on that. Otherwise, we get caught up in all the things leading up to it. So again, from Revelation 21, 3, the church will rule and reign with him forever. And this is what Revelation 21 says. The dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. So he makes his dwelling place with us, with a man, for all of eternity. Hopefully, this paints a little bit more of a picture of what a bride is supposed to be like. Yes, she's going to be fierce. Yes, there's going to be unity as in a body, as in a a building. Yes, we're going to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. All these things will come into play, of course. But our identity as a bride, uh, it almost like encompasses all these different factors that need to play in as we're preparing for the end times. And this is, I believe, it's not just like, all right, these are great characteristics. I hope I can grow in these things. But it's actually something that the Lord will impart to his church. This is the commitment of the Holy Spirit, and that is to sanctify us on this side of eternity, make us more like Jesus. That's his role. That's his job description. That's what his resume would say, like, make the church more like Christ. Yes, I'm a counselor. Yes, I'm going to give wisdom and understanding. Yes, I'm going to open up the word. But, yeah, one of my major roles as a Holy Spirit is going to be to sanctify the church, sanctify the church, purify her, prepare for the things that are to come. Um, And so 
if we get a little bit like, oh, no, like my trust, my anticipation, it's not there, like my love, my oneness, all these things like, oh, my gosh, I have so much to catch up on. Uh, instead of like falling into a place of like anxiety and striving, uh, that kind of will actually work against this entire thing. This is why intimacy is so important. Like in our relationship with the Lord, as we grow more and more in love with the Lord, all these things will come to pass. It's not like if you're about, you've been engaged to somebody, you look and you're like, all right, I got to work on my anticipation right now. Okay, how do we work on my anticipation right now? That's not how it is. The more you look at the person you're going to marry, the more you envision your future together, the more you see the qualities that they have that are going to be able to lead you into life together, that's how your anticipation grows. It's almost like a byproduct, if that makes sense. It's a byproduct of your intimacy and relationship with God. So don't get, like, anxious about, like, oh, my gosh, all these things are not in line, uh, but... As you develop your um, d- relationship and your intimacy, your understanding uh, with the Lord, all these things will fall into place. And that is what the Lord has um, prepared uh, for his bride in the end times. So now comes the question, what does this have to do explicitly with the end times? Why? 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 Why, why is this related to the end times? It could be any time, but why the end times? And so we're going to go a little bit more into depth into Revelation 17, uh, 22, 17. We're going to highlight a couple of different things about this passage. So this is, there's, again, there's many, many different passages that refer to the church as a bride and talk about the end times. It's all over. It's all over the Old Testament. It's all over the New Testament. It's spoken by prophets. It's spoken by Jesus himself. It's spoken by uh, the, the writers of the epistles. It's spoken by everybody so it's all over the bible it's not just the book of revelation um, but this is one of the just clearest uh, passages that refers to this dynamic between the two so let me highlight a couple things one is the spirit and the bride are going to be united in their cry towards jesus and saying come now if you think about just how united you are with the holy spirit right now you feel like, I don't know how much overlap there is. Like, most of the time, I'm war- my f- he's warring my flesh. Like, he's, like, I'm just trying to pull this way, and he's trying to pull me this way. And most times, we're not in agreement. He has to kind of, like, drag me out to his side at times. Um, but can you imagine when there's going to be a time when the spirit and the church are going to be in full agreement, like 100% overlap? Like, oh, that's what you wanted to say? This is what I wanted to say, too. Let's say it both at the same time. One, two, three come and they're going to say it all both at the same time you know what i mean so it's going to be like complete unison oneness in desire oneness in their cry towards the lord jesus and this is what they're going to say together they're going to say come it's an invitation it's not just like well you know it'd be nice but it's about time you show up no it's like this cry this longing like it's almost like the spirit and the bride don't have time to be polite almost does it make sense like it's not like you know it's about time that you know it would be nice if you didn't delay any no no like their cry is like so urgent and it's so all-encompassing that all they can say together is like come just come and there's an exclamation point at at, at the end as well so the spirit and the bride are going to be united in this cry the church is going to be in full unity (sighs) This in itself is going to be a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit because we're not even talking about the Spirit. Okay, just think about the church and the church. The church and the church, right? Like the church, uh, like, you know, this kind of church and that kind of church or like, hey, the Korean church with the Filipino church or like uh, the young church and the old church and or the this denomination against, the, you know, like there's so many divisions already. Just the church saying something at the same time, that's going to be a miracle already, you know? Like that already is a miracle. But then from from that to even like the bride being able to be in unison with the Holy Spirit, fully in unison with the Holy Spirit, that is going to take a supernatural move of the Lord. Like, it's not just going to be like, all right, we all have to make an agreement, and all of us have to say this. No, it's going to be a heart cry that rises up from within, and it's going to be orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. So this should be exciting. Like, it's going to be unprecedented unity with, within the body and then with the Holy Spirit at the same time. And that is what we're going to come together to say. We're going to say, come. Now, second is... I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but let him who hears say come. So it's almost like there's a third party here. Like you're like, okay, the spirit is here. 
well, okay, the spirit and the church are here. There's Jesus here, but who's this? Let him, what, what? Like somebody's overhearing this. Um, when we see this, this is what it should tell you, that God is going to raise up a cry from the spirit and the church where people in the world are going to be hearing this cry. Does that make sense? It's going to be people who are not part of the church who are going to hear the cry of a bride. There's going to be bystanders that are able to hear this cry from the bride, from the lips of the bride. And so let him who hears this cry between the spirit and the bride, they're also going to come into unison because of the testimony of the bride. Does it make sense? Like people who are not part of the bride, they're going to hear this uproar, like this multitude from all over the world saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. And that's going to be a testimony to people who are not in the Lord just yet. They're going to hear unity and see unity like never seen before. So when you think about the passage that says, um, this is how they'll know that, that the, you belong to me, there's going to be unity, there's going to be love. And this is what bystanders are going to hear. They're going to hear the spirit of the bride in unison saying something. And that's going to stir up a response of their own. And they're also going to join in the cry and say, come. So this is talking about people being brought in and a witness from the church in the end times. It means that it's going to be manifest. So it's not going to be like just in my heart, in my prayer closet. It's going to be really hidden. I'm just going to say, come Lord Jesus. No, it's going to be very, very like undeniable, evident, like a city on a hill. It's going to be that blaring our testimony in the end times. And so people that see that, will have a choice to make. And people who hear that, a lot of them will say, in unison, they will say, come. So it's going to be something that will be able to be heard, something that's going to be overtly manifest during those times. And then this is a very exciting part that's going to come from it, and that is this. Let him come. Whoever's hearing this, they're going to come. Have you guys ever heard of the term end times harvest? End times harvest, where... The gospel has been spreading all over the earth, and it's reached the ends of the earth, and there's going to be a massive end times harvest that God brings in. This is what it's talking about. People that see the bride in the end times, they will see something that they're also thirsting for, and in unprecedented levels, and in all over the nations, all over the globe, they're also going to come, and they're going to partake in this free gift of the water of life. So this is not just talking about, it's just my relationship with the Lord. We're just tight. I don't know about y'all, but we're tight. That's not how it is. Like, your relationship with the Lord is going to broadcast something to the entire world, and they're going to come into alignment with that as well, and there's going to be salvations as a response as well. So this is all just within, like, encapsulated in this little verse that we often, like, like yeah, the Spirit of the Bride say, come, blah, 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 and we move on, but it's all of it is encompassed in this, like, one verse. This is really exciting stuff. I hope this gets your, your like, your blood pumping a bit. Like, it's not just like, oh, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, like, I got to stock up. I got to, you know, I got to just get ready, you know. Like, you start thinking along those lines. But it is so much bigger than that. Like, the testimony of the victorious church that has made it through tribulation still in love more pure, more in unity than ever, and more longing for Lord Jesus Christ to come than ever before, um, this is going to have massive repercussions all over the world, and we're going to see salvations like never before. This is all like part of this huge like picture that God is painting for us when he's talking about the end times. So we're only seeing bits and pieces at a time, but when we start seeing a little bit of, of the bigger scope of things, this should get, get us excited and begin to stir up in us like that desire to see Jesus come. Now, I'm not just going to leave it at this. We have to go into applications, like what do we do, right? So what personal and corporate implications does this have? How do we respond to this? And I'm not going to give too many today. I'm just going to give three different ones. This has a lot of repercussions in how we live out this life. Like this shot that we have, the few years that we have here on earth, they're gonna define how we live for eternity. Um, I hope this, this kind of like, like places a little bit more weight 
and what you're able to do in this lifetime or what you've been called to do in this lifetime. So first thing is cultivate intimacy with God. We just cannot get away from this. Like there's no shortcuts through this. Like nobody can impart intimacy. You know, nobody can like here, I give you my history with the Lord. Here you go. That's not how it works. Like you yourself have to build this intimacy with the Lord. So this is what, uh, as I said, once again, like the, the person that I was talking to this past month, this is what they had said. You cannot tackle the book of Revelation if you haven't understood the heart of Song of Songs first. So in other words, our understanding of the end times is most comprehensive, most sustainable, and accurate within the framework of intimacy. Not catching the heart of the bridegroom makes for a very ill-prepared bride. So this is crucial. Like, I think... This is probably the, w- the one, like, this is my soapbox right here. Like, I, until the day I die, I feel like this is what I'm always going to be saying, like, intimacy first, intimacy first. There's no replacement. There's no substitute for it. There's nothing that can uh, substitute intimacy and love with, a, uh, like love with the Lord. All it's going to take is, like, a little bit of shaking and all the things that you thought you were grounded in or, like, secondhand faith. Like, well, my parents believed or, well, I'm part of a great church or, like, well, this is what I've heard being preached. Like, none of that secondhand uh, relationship with the Lord is going to matter when actual shakings come. Because when the rubber hits the road, like, you need to know the Lord. Like, when things get tough, if you're not grounded in love, you're going to be so offended like, who do you think you are, God? Like, I, I can't believe that you do this to my family. I can't believe that you do this to me. There's, like, so much room for the enemy to come in and divide um, if we're not cultivating our intimacy with God. This is, like, uh, I cannot stress it. Like, I cannot stress it enough. Any moment that you spend in cultivating your intimacy with God is time well spent. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Sometimes when people are like, what are you doing with your time? Like, you're just praying, just like singing. Like, what does that do, (laughs) you know? Like, why aren't you out like evangelizing? And without realizing that evangelism is going to flow out from the place of intimacy. You can't have evangelism if you're not intimate with the Lord. You're going to be talking about a stranger then, to a stranger about a stranger. But if you are talking to a stranger about somebody that you're fully in love with. Like, have you ever talked with people like that? Where, like, they're so in love. Like, for example, like, this is my favorite movie, like, Forrest Gump. Like, Forrest Gump is, like, my favorite. Like, you know, there's, like, purity and character. There's, like, a story of grace and the way that he acted. And, the, the, you know, like, when I speak about something with such pure passion, like, all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, I think I really want to go watch that now. You know, there's something very pulling about that. Now imagine me saying, like, yeah, I watched this movie. It's called Force Gump. Eh, I heard it's good. Yeah, I've read the reviews. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it might be worth a watch. You'd be like, eh, maybe. If it's free, you know, maybe I'll watch it. Uh, but there's no pulling power because you don't sense that there's, like, like personal conviction about that particular topic. In the same way, uh, our testimony uh, is just void of power when there isn't that oneness in the relationship with the Lord. So please don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Time that you spend with the Lord is time well spent. Anything that you say no to in order to spend time with the Lord, anything you say no to in order to like make more like mental space for you to be able to spend time with the Lord, anything that you fast from as a gift to the Lord, all these things matter. They're not going to show up on your resume they're, you're not going to get, like, a pat on the back or a cookie or anything like that, but all these things are being noted by God. All these things matter, and they're going to build step-by-step step a relationship of intimacy with the Lord. So any small step that you're able to take, even, like, if you're super crazy busy and you're like, all right, Lord, I'm going to be on this bus for the next 20 minutes, and for 20 minutes I just want to be with you. And that's your offering for the day unto the Lord. That's going to matter. It's very crucial for us to be... Um, 
consistently cultivating intimacy with God. And it's not just like a once in a once in a while kind of thing, or like when it's preached up from the front, or when the song is just right. You know, sometimes we're like super superstitious about certain things. It's like I can't connect with the Lord unless I have this particular song and like I have coffee and you know, like or sometimes we're really superstitious about these things. But like when it comes down to just spend time with the Lord, whatever it takes to spend time with the Lord, uh, cultivate that intimacy with Him. Whether things are ideal for you to connect with him or not. You have crying babies. Like, I hope that, you know, all of us, when we have families and we have, like, kids crawling all around and we have all the chaos all around, we're still going to find a way to cultivate our intimacy with the Lord. We won't be like, all right, for the next 18 years until they're off to college. Like, we're off. (laughs) I just can't. I don't have time and space, you know. Like, no. Like, every day should have uh, some measure of like, this is my gift to you today. All I can all I can give to you is five minutes today. All I can give to you is 20 minutes today. This is like the widow's offering, that like the three copper coins that she, th- she threw in that were like everything that she had. That's like your offering unto the Lord that day. Like all I can afford today is 20 minutes. And this is what I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give fully. Um, that's going to matter in your cultivating the intimacy with the Lord. Now second is despite all the mystery around it and our slowness in grasping many things, we have to study the end times. I think the majority of the church, the way that they uh, view the end times is like, well, uh, it just says that we just don't know when it's going to happen and all these things are like, they've been saying it for a long time and there's, we can't really know for sure and like there's a lot of like, eh, why not focus on something that we know for sure, you know? But that does not take away from our mandate. It's like a command for us to understand the end times. Revelations 1-3, this is the only passage in this entire book. In this entire book, there's only one place in the entire Bible that says, like, if you read this, you're actually going to get blessing just by reading it, just by studying it. And that's the book of Revelation. Maybe God knew how intimidated we would be, and he, like, had to say that up front. He's like, trust me, you're going to be blessed. Just just plow through the 22, you know, plow through the beasts and all that, and <laughs> trust me, you're going to be blessed. So that's what Revelation 1-3 says. It opens up by saying, you know, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take, it, take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. It's the only time in all of Scripture that that is said. Psalms doesn't say that. Not even Song of Songs says that. The, the, you know, the Gospels don't say that. Genesis, no other book in the Bible has ever said this as directly. It says, like, you're going to be blessed just by opening up your Bible to the book of Revelations and reading through it and grappling, you know, with all these things and wrestling with, with whatever you need to wrestle with. You're actually going to be blessed because the time is near. Now, understanding the end times from a place of trust, intimacy, and blessing will prepare the church for the time to come. Each generation is called to study this, since without this, the gospel message is incomplete. Now, let me, this is something that I wanted to clarify, especially for uh, if anybody in here, you know, has felt like jaded by like, you know, they said that the end is coming, you know, like, 20 years ago, it didn't happen. Okay, then 10 years ago, and it didn't happen. Then five years ago, and last year, and uh, like, I don't know, this year with like elections, and you know, like everybody's talking about like end times is now, or it's like tomorrow. And after a while, you get desensitized to these things, and you're like, you know what? Forget this, you know? Like, it's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? Why even think about it? Why even worry about this? Um, But the mandate is for every generation to actually be alert, be awake, be prayerful, read the scripture, study these things. The Lord doesn't say, well, uh, you weren't part of the end times generation, so I'll let you off the hook. Like when you see him face to face, no, you'll be like, why didn't you study all of scripture? I gave you all of this. Why did you only like pick and choose parts? Like uh, I gave you all of this. I give you the entire thing. And all of it were words from my mouth. Like, why do you place so much importance in one part? And then, like, when it gets a little bit hard, then you're like, well, forget this. Like, we'll deal with it when it comes. But he's saying, like, every word uh, in his Bible is important, and every generation is called to steward this, whether you're the end times generation or not. And the biggest reason for this is because the gospel, preaching the gospel without preaching about the second coming is incomplete. It's telling people, all right, you're good for this life. 
I don't know about the next life, you know? Like, maybe you'll make it into heaven, but, you know, yeah, you're not living for any, like, you're good to coast. As long as you don't really sin really bad and you just don't lose your salvation in any kind of way, uh, you're good for the rest of this life. No, like, the call of the gospel is to come and die and live with the vision of a returning king. It's not just like, well, until I die, until I see him, and that's all that there is to life. We're supposed to live as people that were made for a different reality, like of a different citizenship. And the gospel message without the second coming, so only referring to the first coming of Jesus and not the second coming of Jesus, it's an incomplete gospel message. Uh, And oftentimes because, like, oh, we don't want to come off as, like, those weird people that are talking about the coming of Jesus, you know, we kind of, like, completely push away from that. Um, And I admit, you know, I used to, like, judge people hardcore, like, oh, there they go again. They're always talking, yeah, they're talking about the end times. They're always talking about Jesus coming back. And, you know, uh, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be scrutiny, like, when when you are preaching this kind of gospel, not just part of the gospel, the entire gospel. There's going to be scrutiny, and we have to be okay with that. That's, like, you know, at the end of the day, if they have a problem with the second coming, then they have a problem with the Bible, really. And that's, like, something that they have to wrestle with the Lord, not with you um, in the end. So does this make sense? It's part of the gospel. It's not like, well, here's the gospel, and this is salvation, and then there's this second coming. And this is like, this is the stuff that we don't touch. No, all of it is connected together. All of it is part of the grand scheme of things. Um, So part of the gospel message is the coming of the end times and the second coming of Christ and eternity ruling and reigning with him and the end of all injustice, the end of all sickness, all these different things that uh, we experience in this fallen world, we have to talk about the things that are to come. Otherwise, there's very little for us to hope for. We're just hoping for like, oh, I hope that next 40 years are relatively pain-free and I die in my sleep. And, you know, like there's very few things that you are like hoping for, but there's not this eternal glory that you're hoping for. Now, this is the third thing. And this is the most practical thing. Ask for a longing for the second coming. Ask for it. This is probably the most infuriating part about a lot of these things. Sometimes you want to get yourself to care about certain things. Like, you tell me that I'm supposed to long for you, so here, let me try to long for you, you know, and you just try to force it. But oftentimes, um, the way that God has us come into that that reality is to begin by asking. Um, I think that was my personal testimony as well. Like, I was like, Lord, I just don't, like, if I'm honest, I don't feel like I hunger for you. You know, like, you're going to have to help me here. Like, uh, you're going to have to give me hunger. Like, I need the gift of hunger. Um, And that's how a lot of things got started. It got the ball rolling for me. Uh, From Song of Songs, verses 1 and 2, this is kind of like an infuriating part of the Song of Songs. It says, this is coming from... um, uh, the beloved, she's saying, all night long on my bed, I look for the one my heart loves. I look for him, but did not find him. And this is what she does then. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. So this is somebody who's like, okay, I'm finally at a point where I yearn for the Lord. And um, I don't see any breakthrough. Okay, all right, fine, okay, that's how we're going to play, okay. Now I'm going to go out of my way. I'm going to get up from where I am. I'm going to go out of my comfort zone, and I'm going to be aggressive about the search thing, okay? So now I'm going to go all around the city. I'm going to be searching for my lover, and even then, like, I couldn't find him. What the heck, you know? That's the the tone of Song of Songs 3. It happens several times throughout the Song of Songs, actually, where God, uh, God will really, but the beloved stirs up in her a desire, and then it's almost like he retreats, and he is waiting for response of love, of seeking, of longing, of searching from her initiative. It happens several times, and that's kind of like the infuriating part sometimes. We're like, finally, okay, fine. I will cultivate my intimacy with you. All right. All right, here I am. I'm going to show up any moment now, any moment now, and he doesn't show up the first day, and you're like, 
I thought Pastor Susie talked about this last month, and she guaranteed that it's going to transform my life, and he didn't show up. What the heck, you know? And then you go through day two, and then day three, and you're like, what in the world? She was lying all along. I knew it. She looked like a liar, you know? Um, There's, like, a part in you where, like, you feel betrayed. Like, they taught about this, and the Lord promises, but I'm not seeing any difference. What is going on? And this is just a call from the Lord for you to begin to search and look for him, cultivating this posture of hunger and searching. So you can't be like, I look for him, found him, look for him, found him, look for him, found him. Like, it's not like that all the time. Sometimes it is. We go through seasons like that. But a lot of times, the Lord is going to give us just enough to begin to ache for him. You know, like just enough to get us out of our comfort zone and begin to search and really begin to dig after these things and pursue him in the way that he pursues us. And that's just part of the dynamics between us and the Lord. So through setbacks and disappointments, our hearts can often yield to bitterness and offense. But we must be pressed into a place of longing instead of hopelessness. Whenever we feel resistance from the Lord, or like we don't feel like he's reciprocating our longing, uh, there's we have a choice to make. There's two ways that that could affect you. Either it's going to make you veer into hopelessness. Like, see, I knew this all hoax. Like, this is all lies. And maybe it's not meant for me. Maybe uh, it was taught and maybe I wanted this, but maybe it wasn't meant for me. And now you just set me up for disappointment. Um, You could kind of veer into a place of hopelessness. It could either do that or it could do the complete opposite. It could be like, all right, okay, all right. You're not going to make this easy, but I know it's worthwhile. So let me begin to pursue this. Let me uh, put everything uh, in my power, do everything in my power to begin to search after knowing that you're going to find him eventually. Does that make sense? Like this is a turning point for many people when you uh, experience resistance from the Lord. And oftentimes, isn't this how the Lord treats us at times? You know, like sometimes when we first come to get to know the Lord, we're like, oh, my gosh, I'm so in love. Like, I will never need anything else in the world. And all I need is Jesus. I don't need you. I don't need you. I just need Jesus. And, like, this game over. Like, I'm set for life. And then there's gonna, there, then you happen to go through a season where it's not as easy anymore. You're like, what? What, what changed? Did I sin? Did I? You know, you begin to question all these things. And oftentimes what it is is just the Lord bringing us into a place of maturity where he's already captivated our hearts, and he's drawing us out into the search. And often that's what happens to us. So if anybody here is going through a season of dryness, for example, hopefully that's not like, all right, this is my destiny. This is what I'm called to live out for the next 40 years. It's just dryness, wilderness. Thank you, Lord. Great. You know? Uh, Hopefully that's not your response. Hopefully your response is like, this is an invitation. Like, if there's wilderness, I'm going to come out of the wilderness leaning on my beloved. Like, that's where I'm going to end. This is where it all is leading to. Um, And your season of dryness is actually an open door and an invitation to actually seek and find. So these are three very practical points uh, for us to even begin to understand our identity as a bride and our, our role even in the upcoming, in the end times. Um, I didn't really know how to end tonight, but I feel like it would be like doing God a disservice without kind of like touching the heart and the vulnerability of it. And I feel like in some ways, what I mean by this is in some ways we're already seeing, um, we're already seeing like a foretaste and, and a glimpse of the church that is to come, and I think that is the gift of the persecuted church to the entire world. I feel like that's just the gift that they have to give to the world and the rest of the church as well, and that is to give us a vision of a lovesick church that is willing to lay, like, literally everything down, um, risk their lives, risk the lives of their family, um, with this understanding that it's still worthwhile, that if you love the Lord, all these things are, you know, all these things are temporary, and he's still worth giving everything up for. I feel like that is a particular gift the persecuted church has for uh, the rest of us. I feel like that should challenge us, you know? Whenever you read testimonies of the persecuted church, you're like, I don't know if I have that kind of faith, you know? And, but you want to get there, and you know that the Lord is able to make that happen. Um, 
So I actually wanted to kind of close out uh, tonight before we go into a time of, of just prayer and worship. I wanted to just uh, read from this testimony uh, from the persecuted church in North Korea. And this is something that is still happening very much today. It's like only a few kilometers really north of from where we are right now. There's actually people paying the cost um, as well. And uh, so I'm just going to read from this. And this happened actually in the 50s. And this is what it says. Among the persecuted Christians was a congregation of 27 believers led by Pastor Kim in the 1950s. They had literally hand-dug tunnels beneath the earth in order to be able to live there and worship God. When the communists were building a road, they stumbled upon these tunnels and discovered the underground Christians, literally. They were arrested, women and children included, and taken to the village of Koksan for a public trial and execution, where the authorities gathered a crowd of 30,000 people. So they're trying to make an example out of them. Before the authorities and the crowd, they were asked to deny Christ, but refused to. The communist leaders then seized the children in the congregation and tied ropes around their small necks. They asked their parents to deny Christ or their children would die. The parents looked at their children and said, we will see you soon in heaven. And the children died quietly. The officers then had steamrollers brought in took the adults and forced them to lie directly in the steamroller's path, their feet towards it so that they would experience the maximum amount of agony before they finally died. And as they revved the steamroller's engine, they were given one last chance to deny Christ. Again, they refused. And as the steamroller began to inch forward, they began to sing a song that had carried them through years of persecution, that had bound them together as a body of Christ in love, I would now take them all the way home. And as their bodies and their bones were crushed under the weight of the massive rollers, they sang, more love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Thee alone I seek, more love to thee. Let sorrow do its work, more love to thee. Then shall my la latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry my heart shall raise. More love, O Christ, to thee. And so this is, this paints for you what a lovesick church looks like. A church that is able to go through, like, undescribable pain um, and still be able to remain in a place of love. This is why it's so important for us to understand this, especially as end times draws near and persecution becomes more prevalent, um, if we're not grounded in this understanding that we are his bride, that he longs for us, that we have an eternity together, and that we're called to just live this life that is but a breath, to give testimony of who he is and his worth, if we don't understand that, then how will we not be shaken when persecutions do come, when shakings do come? And now this is not something that's just happening, that just happened and just only happens in North Korea, and this happened like back in the 50s. Persecution is very much alive and well. Um, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention with what's happening in the Middle East right now. This is just one of the pictures that I brought, you know, that are less graphic because there's a lot of really graphic stuff out there in the media right now. But these are all Coptic Egyptian Christians. I think, I believe it was 21 of them that were beheaded by ISIS. This happened uh, last year. And these were people who felt like they had nothing to lose when it came to testifying until their last breath of their allegiance to Christ. They were fearless when it came uh, to persecution, and they were willing to give up their lives when the time came to do so. And this is, I feel like as uncomfortable as is it, it is for us to look at this and kind of take it in and accept the fact that it's actually happening right now. I feel like as, as a church, we would do them a disservice and we would almost like belittle their testimony if we, out of discomfort, kind of like avert our eyes and choose to think about happier things that are happening in the world and neglect what's happening with the persecuted church right now. 
It's actually hap- it's very, very prevalent in the Middle East right now. And as I read the story of this, um, of how all this happened, and this was all like documented filmed and this was broadcast on YouTube, like it's really crazy like how much they wanted the world to see this. Um, when I was reading about this, what really shocked me was actually um, the response of the families of these people that were martyred. And what they were saying is like, we have no regrets. You know, as much as we love them, they gave up their life for something that was worthy. And like we would do it all over again. We would give up our lov- loved ones all over again. And this is the kind of testimony that they're challenging the rest of us with, you know? This is the kind of church that God is after. Sometimes it is through the road of persecution that God is able to purify his church to this extent. But something that I think about often is like, would you be able to be a lukewarm Christian if your life was threatened, like in this way, if it was illegal to be a Christian, if you were sentenced to death, just like if you were found with a Bible, like would there be room for lukewarmness? Would there be room for like, ah, like uh, I'm a little embarrassed to talk about Jesus in my workplace, you know? Like is there room for any of that when the stakes are so high? And I feel like that is as heartbreaking and as tragic as all this is, I feel like it is one of the many ways in which God sovereignly purifies his church. And I think in a very real way, that's something that the South Korean church is going to have to come to terms with once the North opens up. We come face to face with believers who actually bear the marks of torture on their body. And you can't be there being like, ah, I don't really like the sermon. And like, there was no parking spot. So like, I don't know. Like, I didn't, I didn't feel like this. I didn't go this Sunday. Like, would you, what, what kind of testimony would you have in front of somebody who has really risked their lives um, to stay true to the gospel? That's what I feel like something, it's going to be a very rude awakening for the South Korean church, I believe. And that's perhaps the gift that the North Korean church, and maybe it's, maybe it's the hope for the revival of the South Korean church. And it's something that has been preserved almost through the means of persecution and of torture and lives being lost. And even through those means, like God is going to use that um, to challenge the church as to like how far are we willing to, to go for our faith? What are we willing to give up for our belief? How much do we truly love him when it actually costs us something? Um, and that's something that, that's just my personal conviction. There's like, you know, I can't tell you it's like a fact, but I believe that that's one of the things that we have to prepare ourselves for. We're going to have to come to terms with that. We're going to have to own up to like where we are at, where the South Korean church is at, uh, when we come face to face with people who have given up their lives to make sure that the testimony of the church is still alive and victorious and North Korea right now. Um, So with that said, um, I want us to take some time to pray. And if Michelle, if you could just turn on some music. I'm just going to ask for us to take some time to pray. um, Just this last point that we were talking about, asking for a longing for the second coming. We cannot, we cannot grapple with any of these things unless there's a longing in us. And for me, it was a very personal, it was, it was a very supernatural work of the Lord that God like, really did in my heart. Um, I like to refer to it as almost like an, it was like almost like a, it was like an alien longing. It's like it felt that foreign. Like it wasn't there five minutes ago. I don't know where this longing came from. It was like one of those things where God just deposited like a cry in me as I was simply positioning myself like lord i i need hunger i don't know how to do this unless you like really like hit me with hunger like i cannot i cannot work myself into this um and the lord answered in that way and i believe that for some people tonight maybe that that's what the lord has in store for you as well 
And so I wanted to make sure that we wouldn't pass by tonight, just rush through tonight without taking a time for us to pray for these things. So for the next, let's say, 10, 15 minutes, I'd just like us to take...